kind of bittersweet for me because I've enjoyed the book of Romans thoroughly. What a book it is. And getting to the last chapter is kind of like getting to the last episode of a favorite television show that you like to watch. It's, uh, you want to see the end of it, but at the same time when it's over, you're kind of like, <laughs> but you know, we've got 65 other books, so we got other places to go. And I really do feel like God answered a prayer for me about where we need to go after this. Uh, but the book of Romans chapter 16 is the close of this epistle to the saints in Rome. Paul makes mention of several individuals, some we recognize, others we don't. He commends them for their service and for his personal relationships with them. And I want to say on a side note, personal relationships is huge. Amen. The Bible is a book about relationships. The Bible teaches that we're supposed to have good marital relationships. We're supposed to have good parental relationships. The Bible teaches us to be good friends. And so what I'm trying to say by that is, do you know how many times the Bible compares humanity to grass? Many times. You know why that is? Grass is connected. And that's what he's saying is, and my dad has said for years, he's right, no person is an island. Amen. The devil wants you offended. He wants you cut off from the herd. And it's because as soon as he gets you like that, you get devoured. Amen. So the, what, I, what teaches me in the book of Romans chapter 16, Paul had a lot of friends. Amen. He speaks well of all these people. And Paul was careful not to speak evil of people. He, said, he told us not to do that. And so I, I've been praying, and, and I want the Holy Spirit to always help me to see the best in my brothers and sisters. Right. And somebody said, well, they just do this, and that aggravates the far out of me. Well, let me tell you something. You aggravate the far out of me. <laughs> so the thing of it is, is we just need to for, we'll do what the Scriptures say. We forbear one another Amen. in love. Amen. Every time I, I think about that, I'm thinking, but yeah, but there's, they probably don't like the way I comb my hair. So, I mean, so then there's that. I mean, some people don't like it that I get, that I scream when I preach. I've had people visit this church and they told the people that brought him, they said, that guy was angry. Did you see how angry he was? I said, no, it's called passion. There's, that's the only way that comes out. But what I'm trying to say is, is I, listen, if you don't raise your voice above what I'm speaking right now and you preach and you're preaching the word of God, I'm for you. Right. If you turn red in the face and act crazy like I do and you preach the word of God, I'm for you. Amen. 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 So, uh, Paul, I will say, I just said that as a sidebar. Listen, we've got enough division. Yeah. Stupid division. Amen. Now I'm gonna tell you something. If it's doctrinal division, okay, we need to. We, okay, we'll divide on that. When it's essential doctrine. When it's not, leave it alone. Amen. 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 So, his final matter of fact, Paul gives final instructions towards the end of this chapter about marking people who are always causing division. Now, I'm gonna tell you something. That we've got a real problem with that in the church as a whole. Now you got all these watchdogs running around. Nobody's right but them. And all they do is they, they nitpick. My, my wife has an aunt, and I loved it. She said, every church has got hens. She said, they peck. And you got these people now running around on social media, and that's all they do is peck over little stupid stuff that don't matter about nothing. Everybody's a heretic. Everybody's a compromiser. I'm going to tell you something. When everybody is wrong but you, you the problem. Amen. Amen. Romans 16, verses 1 and 2, Paul starts out, he says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that ye receive her in the Lord as become a saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succourer. The word succourer means she's been a help. She's been an aid. She's an assister of many and of myself also. The word commend is the same as what we would say recommend. Paul says, I recommend this sister unto you. Here's why he has to recommend her. When saints traveled in the early church, between churches, it was common for them to have letters of commendation so that the church would have no reservations about receiving them. The early church had to be careful. They couldn't just receive just anyone because of the persecution. Somebody may have been trying to slip in on them. Number two, there was a lot of deceivers. So when somebody traveled from church and somebody said, well, I'm here to help. How do we know you're here to help? Well, I've got a letter of commendation by Paul, by Timothy. These, are, these people recommend me. So that's what he was saying here. Paul said, I commend her to that. Um, Paul commends Phoebe here not only as a Christian, but as a great helper to many people, including himself. He said, she's helped me. 
she'll help you. Then verses 3 through 4, he said, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Priscilla and Aquila, we know them, because the Bible mentions them several other places. They were tent makers. Paul was a tent maker. Paul lived with them for a while because they were the same trade. Uh, they were a great help to a lot of people and to another preacher named Apollos. I have these scriptures in here from Acts 18, 24 to 26. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, means you would like to have heard Apollos preach. He spoke in a way it sounded good to your ears. The Bible said he was mighty in scriptures. He came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. I have the next part underlined. Knowing only the baptism of John. That was a real problem because we had the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But here's what the fellow was doing. He was doing as good as he could with all the knowledge that he had. John had baptized him. That's why he's preaching that. That's all he knows. But look at what Aquila and Priscilla does. Priscilla and Aquila didn't get on Facebook and say, this guy is only preaching the baptism of John. The Bible said, and he began to speak boldly in their synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla had heard, Priscilla and Aquila had been with Paul. They knew some things. The Bible said they took him unto them. I think they did it kindly. And expounded. The word expounded means they explained it in great detail. Unto him the way of God more perfectly. You know what they did? They helped Apollos become a better preacher. I think they were kind. And I think they were helpful. So I will say this also about them. They were expelled from Rome. We have that in other places of the Bible. Under the orders of Claudius, they, uh, Claudius ordered all the Jews out of Rome. So they had, these are people that had to leave their home because of who they were. Not only that, they hosted a church in their house. We need to remember this throughout all the epistles. No church buildings. No driving down to the church. It was in somebody's home. In every country it was that way. So they, they probably were in the crosshairs for having a church even in their own house. Uh, and they were very knowledgeable people. Verse number five, he said, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. That backs up what I just told you. He said, Salute my well-beloved Epinatus, if I'm saying that, his name correctly. Who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ? This is going to be interesting. Achaia is another name for a region of Asia and was a Roman province whose capital was Corinth. We understand that because of the book of Corinthians. Didn't realize, maybe we didn't know that Achaia was the name of the region. He said this man was the first fruits. That means he's the first fella saved in that region. Here's how we know, here's, here's what is an interesting connection. It is believed that Epinatus was the Philippian jailer. Because the reason why I say that, he's the first man saved after Paul's vision of a man pleading with him to go into Macedonia, which is in that region, and help them. He's the first man saved. And I, I will say this, the letter to the Philippians probably went into Epinatus' hand because the church would have been in his house because he was the first man in. That's interesting. Verses 6 and 7, greet Mary. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's too many Marys in the Bible for me to tell you who that is. There must not, listen, they must not have had a thousand and one baby names at the time when all the Marys were running around because as far as I know, I mean, we have all these names for all these different men, but it's Mary, the sister of Mary, who had a cousin named Mary, who lived next to an order to another Mary. <laughs> Mary, the mother of the Lord, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the wife of Cleopas. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So whoever this woman is, I don't know, but she's in a great company because there's a lot of people with her name. She says, who bestowed much labor on us? I'm going to take a side note here. There's a lot of women mentioned in these texts. You ever hear people say that Paul was anti-woman? Oh, I've heard it. Paul's anti-woman. He wasn't married, and he's the one that said, don't let women speak in the church. By the way, you've got to know the context of that scripture. It's not talking about praise, and it's not, talk no, it's not what it means at all. But I've heard people say, Paul was against women. Looks like to me, Paul affirmed women. He said, you accept her. I commend her to come into your church and help you. She's helped other churches. He's talked well of about Priscilla. That's a woman. And he's greeting this woman and says she's been in much labor. So I want to tell you, the next time you hear somebody say Paul was against women, you can chuck that in the garbage. Amen. We got too much text to tell us otherwise. Amen. 
salute Andronicus and Junia. Junia is a woman as well. He said, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Those people were saved before Paul was. They also went to prison with Paul. When he says, my kinsmen, not only are they Jews, they could have possibly been blood relatives of Paul's or at the least from the same tribe as he was. That's what he means by kinsmen. Verses 8 through 10, he said, Greet Amplius, my brother in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. And Stachys, my brother. Salute Epiles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. Epiles, if I'm saying his name right, it said he's approved in Christ. In some fashion, he had been tested and had passed the test because the word approved means to be proven worthy. So that man... But now let's say this. It don't say much about this man. It says he's approved in Christ. If the Bible didn't say nothing else about me, I'd be tickled to death if it just said that. It said he was tested and he stood the test. Not only that, uh, when it says uh, Paul has a great wide variety of folk. There are people that are noble in this list. There are people that are slaves in this list. This Aristobulus is not a Christian. Who he is greeting is the slaves who are saved in his household. That's what it's mean by what's meant by that about his household. Uh, let's see here. I've got more pages. I got too many pages and don't know which one I'm on. When he says uh, the salutation was to the servants, or to the salutation was to the those of his household was to the servants or the slaves in his house. Verses 11 and 12. It says, "Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus." Now. Same thing with him as it was Aristobulus. He's greeting slaves in their house that have been converted, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Again, they that were of Narcissus' house were servants or slaves. Tryphena and Tryphosa were sisters and they were believed to be twins. Makes sense with the way that they're named. This is going to be real interesting. Verse 13 says, Salute Rufus chosen in the Lord and his mother in mind. It is believed this Rufus named here is the son of the man that helped Jesus carry the cross on the day of the crucifixion. I got Bible for what I just said. Look at Mark 15, 21. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian. By the way, when the Bible says they compelled him, he didn't want to do it. They pressured him to. Well, it was the Roman government. They flat out forced him to. He was trying to get out of town they stopped him and have, have him help Christ carry the cross. Here's what's interesting. I've been saying for many years, as long as I'm down here, I'm going to tell you this. When the Bible gives you details, it's for a reason. Amen. It's not because we're trying to fill up space or the Holy Ghost is trying to be cute. There's a reason. Now, don't you know that we could have learned that Simon the Cyrenian helped Christ carry the cross and not known who his kids were? Right. The Bible goes out of its way in Mark 15, 21 to tell us this Simon whom they compelled was the father of Alexander and Rufus to bear his cross. Some have said, and I, and I, this is conjecture. I mean, this is according to, this isn't wrote down in concrete, but it is believed that Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, stayed in the home of Rufus while he was a student of Gamaliel. And Paul was a student of Gamaliel. We got Bible for that. After his conversion came, he went back and won them to the Lord. So apparently the mother of Rufus also nurtured Paul when he was a younger man because he called him her his own mother. It's not his natural mother, but she looked after him like one. So how would you I think about this? How would you like to be living with Saul of Tarsus and thinking, okay, this guy's going to be the greatest of Pharisees? <laughs> He gets saved. Then he comes back to your house and says, let me tell you about a fellow I just met. Yeah, right. And his, his testimony must have been persuasive because he said Rufus was chosen in the Lord. Rufus believed what he heard. I think I find that extremely interesting. Then it says in verses 14 through 16, Salute and, and Syncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. More saints here are mentioned, but we don't really have any information about them on these people. Yet Paul speaks of them 
all specifically by name. Let me say this to you. Do you know how many people that are in the body of Christ, we don't know their names, we don't know anything about them, yet Jesus Christ knows them specifically Amen. by name, and their names are recorded just like these people's names are? Nobody in the body of Christ is going to get to the judgment seat of Christ and be forgotten, Amen. overlooked. Amen. Amen. That's why Brother Carl gets a little bit beside himself singing that song, I Know My Name's There. Yeah. Because if your name ain't there, you can't go. Amen. So that's important. And here's the thing about it. You realize your name won't be overlooked, won't be misplaced, won't be erased. Amen. I thought more people would shout on that. Ain't going to be erased, forgotten. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Verses 17 and 18. He said, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. What he says is, when you mark somebody, that means you take note of them. He's, here's the people he said to mark. You take notice of those people whose aim is to bring division and offenses. Here's the thing about it. Here's why they're deceptive. Because they appear to be righteous. They have righteous indignation. They're just such great lovers of truth. No. Most of the time when somebody's out there railing on somebody, if you look behind it, it's because they're jealous of them. Amen. I had a good brother on the phone tell me yesterday he was invited to a camp meeting in his area. He said, I refuse to go. I said, why is that? He said, all they wanted to do was bash this other preacher because he's famous and they're not. I thought, man, I thought we had the word of God to preach. I mean, I thought we were supposed to preach a book. I'm not, going, I'm not spending five seconds on anything like that. And I'll tell you something. I've had preachers preach in this pulpit that I'm not going to have back because of they have went off the deep end. But you don't see me on Facebook running them down either. You know what? Because they're serving Jesus Christ. They'll either stand or fall to him. It don't have nothing to do with me. And not only that, if they're saved, they're in the body of Christ. And I'm not... I'm not trying to, listen, my spiritual gift isn't cutting others down. I tell you what, most of the time, I, I see it all the time. I show my wife, people on Twitter, there'll be some man on Twitter behind some pul pulpit like this. You'll count about five people in the crowd. He's up there red in the face, spitting on everybody, and all he's doing is preaching against his brother so-and-so, preacher so-and-so, preacher so-and-so. Here's why he's mad, because there's only five people at his meeting and about 150 at his. Here's the thing about it. Here's what B.R. Lakin said. If you can't treat the coon, don't shoot the dog that can. Amen. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Envy is the ugliest thing in the Bible. Amen. Murder is right next to envy everywhere. Jesus Christ was put on a cross because they envied him. Amen. Paul was chased from town to town because the Jews envied him. Same thing. Jews, the Jews had a bunch of dried up, crusty synagogues. Ain't nobody going to. Paul went into town, had the power of God with him, preaching the grace of God. The next week, the entire town would show up and the Jews would be boiling mad. You know what? His crowd was bigger than theirs. That's why they hated Paul. That's why it was so much, it, they hated him so bad, they were chasing him from city to city. Yeah. Here's what amazed me about the Pharisees. They couldn't stand the Lord, yet they couldn't stay away. Right. They couldn't stay away. Right. If you don't agree with him, why would you go to his meetings? Right. John the, I like the way John the Baptist handled that crowd. He just called them snakes before they ever got to the meeting. Right. He said, you bunch of vipers, who told you to come out here and get baptized? Yeah. Every time I read that, if I, 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 I wish I could have stood up there. I'd have been, I, John would have been on the hickory stump, and I'd have been the fellow way in the back that would have stood up and said, Amen! <laughs> Preach against them snakes, brother. Amen. I'll tell you something. we got a lot of Baptist snakes today, too. Yes, Posing as the holier. Yes. Heard a man say one time, There's other people that preach better than I do, but nobody lives holier than I do. You know what? That's pride. Amen. Nobody lives better than you? Okay. Pride is the thing that took Lucifer out of heaven, <laughs> turned him into Satan. Pride's ugly. God, and by the way, there's a list of what God hates, and, and it's found in Proverbs chapter 6. Number one on the list ain't homosexuality, to your surprise. It ain't murder and it ain't rape. It's pride. God said, I hate that worse than anything else. Then he said, uh, he told him, he said, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. He said they don't serve the Lord. They act like they are. 
When he said they serve their own belly, your belly is where your lusts come from. He said they serve their own desires. And he said, they, and they talk good. He said they're able to trip up and trick up. And, and he said they deceive the hearts of the simple, the uh, people that don't know any better. He said, mark them and avoid them. Verses 19 through 20, he said, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and, simply, and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Paul is commending these people for their obedience to which he said everybody noticed it. Did you catch that? He said your obedience has come abroad unto all men. Everybody sees your obedience. Then when he, he moves on, he said, I want you to be sent. No, when he, when he's doing a little word play here. He said, I would have you to be wise unto that which is good. In other words, I want you knowledgeable in good things. And in evil things, I want you to be ignorant. Amen. Somebody that's simple is ignorant. Right. He said, I want you to be ignorant about something that's evil. But I want you to be knowledgeable about the stuff that's good. Then he says this. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Man, if you couldn't shout on that, maybe we need to have about three weeks of revival so you could shout on that. I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I'm looking forward to having victory. Amen. I mean, we've got it now. But I'm saying I'm looking forward to, to putting my... Uh, brother, uh, brother Dillard Cole said, he said, I would that the Lord would let me give him a good kick on my way up. <laughs> Somebody said, I don't know about that. Well, it looks like to me it's scriptural. He said right here he was going to bruise him under our feet. Yeah. And here's the, here's the word I like in that phrase, shortly. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We need that. Amen. Uh, Paul's exhorting these folks by saying, he said, I, he said, I'm praying that you'd gain victory and would be able to come all of those whose arts they are, those are who are endeavoring to sow discord and con contention among them. Let me say this. Where there's, where there's evil division, not good division, where there is evil division, the serpent is behind that. God is not in that. The Lord is in unity, unity, unity. The devil is in division, division, yeah. division. I said on Sunday, and I'm going to say it again. Here's why he wants us divided. If you want to know what the church is capable of when it's in unity, just read the book of Acts. Amen. The devil couldn't do nothing with the church. It overran him everywhere it was. Amen. Somebody had, And by the way, a quil, or, uh, the two people that got killed in Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira, I get them confused with Aquila and Priscilla. Lord, I'm liable to have Aquila and Priscilla killed off up here. I get them confused. Ananias and Sapphira, you know why the Lord, and by the way, they were saved? Yes. The church, the, church, the church fell under fear. Why would the church fall under fear if they weren't saved? Right. Right. You know why God dealt with them so severely? Because it was the first sin to take the church out of unity. Amen. First time that people lied to the Holy Ghost. Sinners can't lie to the Holy Ghost. Amen. So that tells you why, oh, uh, over in Old Testament, they're in unity. As they go across Jordan, they take, they take Jericho. You know why God was so severe with Achan and his family? It's the first sin to take them out of unity. Amen. So, having said that, then he said in verses 21 through 24, he said, Timotheus, there's a name we recognize. Or we know him by his American name, Timothy. Tim for short. <laughs> Timotheus, my fellow worker, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsman, salute you, I tertuous who wrote this epistle, salutes you in the Lord, Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church, saluteth you, Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, salutes you, and Cordus, a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Timothy was Paul's son in the faith, not a natural son, but a spiritual son, a young pastor that he mentored. Lucius is the same fellow that's mentioned in Acts 13.1, and he's named among the prophets and the teachers in the church at Antioch. Uh, Jason had a church in his house in Thessalonica. You can find that in Acts chapter 17. He was arrested for housing Paul and those that were with him. Tertius is the man that wrote this epistle physically. Paul wrote it mentally. In other words, Paul dictated. Tertius wrote down what Paul said. Here's why it had to be that way. Paul's eyesight wasn't any good. Right. It was, his eyesight was bad. So, and this fellow must have thought it. No, and the Holy Spirit allowed him to put this note in that we understand. That we understand that he physically wrote it. 
Paul mentally wrote it under the influence and direction of the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing about it. Paul would personally add some remarks to the end of the epistle or he would sign it himself because he wanted to make sure to the church he sent it to that they knew it wasn't a forgery because we find out in other epistles there had been forgeries. So Paul would let another man write it while he dictated it, but he would sign it. Uh, he wrote the epistle of Galatians by himself. Here's how I know. He said, you see how large an epistle I write? He wrote the letters big because he couldn't see. Um, Gaius, he hosted the church in Corinth. So when we read the epistles to Corinth, it went to Gaius' house because it was in his house. Erastus was also in Corinth. He was the treasurer of that city. Nothing is known about Cordus except for the fact that he's a brother and that'll be good enough. We don't know anything else about him. Now, verses 25 through 27, this is the end of the epistle. Paul says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Then there's a PS on this written to the Romans from Corinthus. That's where it was written at, sent by Phoebe. Phoebe's the one that physically carried the letter, and she carried it there from the church of Centuria. What does Paul mean by my gospel? That's a phrase he says a lot, my gospel. So let's take a minute here and dive in because we need to know what that means. Amen. When he says my gospel, he's not saying he's the only one preaching the gospel of grace of Jesus Christ because there were others preaching that before him. He's not saying I'm the only one preaching for sinners and they're getting saved. So what is my? My means it's exclusively mine. Here's what we need to understand. The word gospel simply means good news. Amen. There's more than one gospel. Amen. Now, what I just said would get me thrown out of a lot of churches, but I got too much Bible to prove it. Amen. There's the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus Christ called it the gospel of the, right. the good news of the kingdom of God. Right. Then there's the good news of the grace of God through right. Jesus Christ. Right. Then those that read the revelation knows there's, there's something over there called the everlasting gospel. Amen. And it's not either one of those two. When Paul says, my gospel, so he's saying, my good news. What is Paul's good news? Paul is the only one of his day that it was revealed to him that the Jews and the Gentiles are now in the same body and there ain't no difference between them. Even Peter couldn't understand that. So when he says my gospel, he's saying I have the good news that God is dealing with everybody on an individual basis and when you get saved there's no difference now whether you're a Jew or a Gentile whether you're black whether you're white whether you're yellow whatever you are let me show you I got as we end here I'm going to show you Paul wrote this over and over my gospel then he explained what my gospel is Colossians 1 25 to 27 Paul said whereof I am made a minister the things I have underlined are important not that it's not all important, but important to the point I'm making. According to the dispensation of God, which is given for me to you. The word dispensation means a space of time in which God deals with man. I get accused all the time, and I'm guilty. On Facebook, people say, you dispensationalist. You, amen. You looking at a dispensationalist. I'm not in the garden, and I'm not under the law. So that must be, if we don't believe in dispensations, then you can go anywhere you want to in the Bible, and it all fits to you. But I'm not in the garden today, and, I don't, and I've never carried my sacrifices to the temple. Somebody say amen right there. I'm not under that dispensation, so I'm thankful that I'm living in this dispensation. The Bible's a dispensational book, and if you don't understand that, you'll wreck your Bible. So he said, this dispensation of God, Paul said, it was revealed to me what it is. He said, to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery. When the Bible says mystery, it means it wasn't known before, but it is known now. Look at what I have underlined, which hath been hid from ages and from generations. When God hides something, you can't see it. Amen. If it had been hid, I love all these people that preach about the church in the Old Testament. Church ain't in the Old Testament. You're crippled too high for crutches. There's no church in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ said he'd come to build a church. Why would he be building it if he's already here? 
there's no church of the Old Testament. Somebody said, you act like you're mad. No, I'm passionate again. I'm a, that'll wreck your Bible. Amen. That'll wreck your thinking. There's no church in the wilderness. I know what that verse says in Hebrews. The word church means a called out assembly. It's not talking about born again believers. He said it was hid. You know what that means? You know what the prophets couldn't see in the Old Testament? The church. They, they could tell you about the eternal ages. They could tell you about... An, uh, do you realize Isaiah saw farther than John did? Isaiah's vision goes past into the new heavens, new earth. He right. saw all the way through that. Right. You know what he couldn't see? A church. Right. You know what Jeremiah couldn't see? A church. Right. Couldn't write about it. You know why? God hid it from their view. I've been saying this for a long time. I'm going to keep on saying it. The church came in as a mystery in Acts 2, and it's going to leave as a mystery. So what do you mean leave as a mystery? One day we're going to be gone, and they ain't going to know what happened to us. Yep. Amen. Amen. God will hide it from them. He said it was hid in the past. But he said, now is it made manifest to his saints. In other words, God's revealed it. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Ephesians 3, 1 through 7, he actually goes into more detail here. He said, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. I'm going to say this again. I know I beat this drum a lot, but we need to because there's so much heresy being taught today. I love all these people making videos on Scripture about the church, and they don't touch Paul's writings. How can you do that? Right. Paul is my Gentile. Hey, Paul is my apostle. Yeah. And I'm going to say this, and it's going to hairlip somebody watching this on Facebook. And I'm saying it to you in love. I ain't mad at you. Everybody that believes in losing salvation won't touch Paul's writings. Amen. They'll quote you Matthew 24, endure to the end. The same, he that endures the end, the same shall be saved. We're not even talking about a church. Right. Talking about a tribulation. Right. Better, that's why you better know your dispensations. Amen. 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 They'll run over to the Jewish epistles, yeah. quote something over there, or they go to the Old Testament. Once you go to Paul, he's your, he's your apostle. Amen. Everybody that believes in falling from grace won't touch Paul's epistles. Right. You heard it here first. Write it down. I'll sign it. Tell them I said so. Everybody that tells you that's possible, everything they quote, it will not be found in Paul's books. So he said, if you have heard of the, there's that dispensation word again. Heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. And that's what we're living in now. Which is given me. Paul said it was given to me to understand this for your good. How that by revelation, when it, you know what Paul said? Jesus Christ revealed it to me. Amen. I didn't dream it up, and no man taught it to me. Yep. You know what he's saying is, I got this information from the man himself. Amen. He said, Jesus Christ revealed this by revelation. He made known unto me the mystery. There's that word mystery again. People didn't know it in the past, but we know it now. As I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, prophets couldn't see it, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit revealed it to them, that the Gentiles, here we are, talking about us folk again, Amen. that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, Amen. comma, and of the same body, Amen. comma, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Amen. When Paul says, my gospel, that's what he's talking Amen. about. Amen. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Look up at my face. Amen. I like Paul's gospel. Amen. You know why? It, it means a whole lot to me because I wasn't born with the 12 tribes. Right. Amen. So I, it's, it's good news to me to find out that there's no difference between me and a, Jew, and a Jew getting saved. I want to say this. Brother Kidd, he'll be with us here in a few weeks. But some time ago, and I'll say this to you in closing. Some time ago, he was in his backyard. And this little dog come running into his yard. And it wasn't, and if, you don't, if you remember from last year, Brother Kidd's not fond of dogs. So he told his wife, he said, come here and watch me kick this thing. He said he got over and get ready to give that dog a good swift kick. He said a guy came around his head just going, here, boy, here, here. Where are you? He thought, he's over. He said, I'll reach down and start petting him. He said, he's over here, brother. Come on over here and get him. <laughs> that fellow sat down and Phil got to talking with him and found out that he was a direct descendant of the 12 tribes of Israel. Full-blooded Jew. Knew his genealogy. Brother Kidd said, can I tell you about Jesus Christ? 
So he told him, told him about the cross, told him about the payment for his sin, told him all that stuff. That fellow looked at him, he said, I've never heard that before in my life. He said, I've never heard that before in my life. But it must have got on him because he came to church and wanted to hear more about this gospel that he'd never heard before. And Phil said when he walked down the aisle and got saved, he said people were swinging off the of chandeliers, throwing babies in the balcony, <laughs> people jumping in the baptistry. To think that a full-blooded Jew of the 12 tribes got saved, and here's the thing about it, he's no more saved than I am. He's not on a higher level saved. We're equal. We're 100%. And he, he said, brother, he said, they just about tore the place down over that. But here's what Paul got. That's what Paul's gospel is. No difference. You can grab a hunk of Bible this thick where there is a difference. You're not on the same plane. The ball is not in your court. You are a foreigner, a stranger, and an alien. But I love this phrase in Ephesians. But now. You know what that means? Right now. Things have changed. But now. We who sometime were afar off have been made nigh. By the blood of Christ. Amen. I say hallelujah for the blood of Christ. I'm, amen. I'm, I'm glad I got washed. Yes. Clean. Can't find nothing on my record. God threw my record. God threw my case out of court and I've been justified. Yes. Amen. I'm as righteous as Abraham. Yes. Isaac and Jacob. Yes. All right. That's my little sermonette. All right. Stand to your feet. I hope you've enjoyed the book of Romans. Amen. Oh, what a book it is. Yes. Brother Mike, dismiss us in a word of prayer.